Hello everyone, welcome to Gateway Christian Fellowship. And as we all know, this is the first week of the MCO, the Movement Control Order in Malacca. And I think for some of us, we may feel a little overwhelmed because it's like we're not so sure, you know, what's going to happen next. But in the Bible, it tells us that when we put our hope in God, he is an anchor for our soul. And this morning, as the music team leads us all into worship, come with us. And as we sing the songs, may your faith be strengthened. May your heart find the peace that it has that can come from God when we worship him and have him as our hope. And let us all raise our hallelujahs to the Lord. Praise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody.
greater mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, is my song. You are
are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is a bit like a deja vu that we're all back again on for online services. Well, I trust that you are doing well at home and that you are well in heart, well in mind, and well in body as much as God allow us. So, before I start the sermon, I'd like to remind you of our Bible study that we have planned for this next 10 weeks. The approach for this Bible study is slightly different from other times. We like us to study the book of Romans together. So that's why we call it reading Romans together. We read one passage a day from Monday to Friday. Then on every Friday at 8 p.m., we have an online discussion. I'll be hosting that discussion. We'll do it on Zoom. We really hope you can join us. As we move on in the days ahead of us, it seems like there are so many things that disrupt our community of faith, a community of believers. And this is one means we hope that can at least strengthen our bonds as brothers and sisters and as a gathering of God's people. So there'll be more information on the Gateway Info and also on our website. I look forward to learning the book of Romans together with all of you. This morning's sermon, I'd like to talk about the three voices of restoration in Isaiah chapter 40. You may be aware that I am using a, a phrase, three voices, um, maybe alluding to this very famous image of the three tenors that are found um, around, that's very popular with many people. These three tenors have sung in many places, but I picked that particular image because they had one uh, record or album that was called Three Voices for Eternity. So something in that caught my attention and said, yes, these are not just three voices, but these are three voices for eternity. First, the background to this important chapter, Isaiah chapter 40. We have covered part of this some time back. Most scholars consider this book of Isaiah to be broken into two parts. From chapters 1 to 39 is the first part, and chapters 40 to, 40 to 66 is the second one. So when we come into chapter 40, it's really the start of a second section. And as scholars will point out, the tone of the message found in the first part is so different from that of the one in the second section. The second section, where chapter 40 begins, is actually announcing something very wonderful. It is saying that the exile or the captivity of the people of God in Babylon is now over. It is over because a new king has ascended on the throne, King Cyrus, the Persian king. He, uh, he set out a decree to release the Jews to go back home. So indeed, if you were standing there on that day hearing the voice of this uh, decree, joy will fill your heart. There is now a new day coming to the people of Israel. The exile is over. The Jews can go back to Jerusalem, the city of God that they long for. The kingdom of God has come. I say the third line emphatically. The kingdom of God has come. God's kingdom has come upon the children of Israel again. Jews have been aware that they have been without a king for the last 70 years. What happened? The last king, King Zedekiah, was sent into exile. We hear that the Babylonians who ransacked the city of Jerusalem took out his eyes and bound him in fetters of brass and carried him 
all the way to Babylon. Earlier, he, they had killed all his children. So he died without an heir. So the prospect or the chance of having a, somebody who would be king for all those years in the exile was totally gone because the king, the last king, Zedekiah, died. Something about the general note of these three voices. They are not three discordant uh, voices. They are harmonious voices. They are like three notes and they form together one single note in unison speaking the same message. So it, why does God put it that way? I suppose he has one thing is that he's a God of variety. He likes to do, do things differently. Sometimes he adds certain touches that are more beautiful or better sounding. And this is just one of those things where well, if it, instead of just one voice, he put them into three voices. And you can actually, I'm just following where the word voice appear in this passage. And the first one we see is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Verse 3 says like this, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Much has been talked about, the valleys will be brought up, of the road itself, that prepare the way. So the valleys will be brought up, the hills will be brought low and so on. And there, are, there is a lot of things to say about what this whole leveling of the road is all about. But behind all that, in the context of what Isaiah is trying to say, this announcement is really announcing the journey, uh, procession of the king to go back to his throne. So this is the image that should stay with us when we think about this prepare the way. It is to prepare a road for the king to begin his journey for his coronation or for his crowning. And this highway, this road is made to fit for a king to travel on. The highway is for God as king. The road is the king's highway going back to Jerusalem to claim back the city that he was once part of and also to be crowned as a king of his people again. This king is God himself. So the journey is like a procession to crown the king that we find many times mentioned in the book of Psalms. So the king is right at the head of the procession and also he is coming in in all his grandeur and all his uh, uh, beautiful things and he's coming into Jerusalem and it involves the building of the temple because God is God and He is in the temple as a sign of His presence among His people. And He's also going to be king of the city. So the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which we read a lot in Ezra and Nehemiah. God is saying, I am going to be with my people in a special way again, right in the midst of them to bring about his kingdom to bring about his blessings for the people of Israel. When Jesus first came into public ministry, the gospel writers showed that his opening words were, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God 2,000 years ago. And he also is coming into our hearts day by day. If you take the context of the Lord's Prayer, for example, the Lord's Prayer has this line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, is, is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So if you put the two together, the daily bread must be prayed every day. And you put that earlier verse about the kingdom come, likewise you can say, we should pray not only for daily bread to come, but for the kingdom of God to come daily as well. Then finally, he will also come at the last day. That will be what most people understand in Christian uh, teaching as the second coming of Christ. He has come 
in Isaiah's time. He came during the gospel's time. He is coming daily into our hearts and he will come in his ultimate and final sense at the last day. So God is always coming to us. Today, God is coming to us. We need to open our hearts to him, to welcome him, to bring about his rule into our own hearts because King Jesus does not rule by force, but by love. He wants to rule and bring about the characteristic of this kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost into our lives. We need to know that this hope must be in front of us in hopeless times, in difficult times, in times when things are so inconvenient, when things don't go our way, things happen in a way that we don't like, we need to keep this hope in front of us that there is a kingdom that we live in now and that there is a kingdom that will come at the final day. And this kingdom is for us because if we believe in Jesus, this kingdom becomes our possession as well. And we know that it is not all a finished work in our hearts, but it will come in on a daily basis to us. The second voice is speaking about the king's word. The first one, of course, is the king's road. Now this is the king's word. Verse 6 says, A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? So this probably refers to a prophet or somebody, so some individual in the midst of the, the particular area that they are in. What shall I cry? And his message is like this. All flesh is grass. And all his beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. Then he says in verse 8 again, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This voice by an individual is calling to people in general everywhere. Through the audience can be the people of the Jews in exile, but it seems like this voice is speaking in a very broad context, and everybody who hears this word hears it in this way, that flesh is grass. People are like grass, transient. The word of God is eternal, permanent, forever. The times are always changing, whether we like it or not. Today also, we go through another big change. Last time, no MCO. Then in March, we got MCO. Somewhere through the year, we have half an MCO. And now we are back to having an MCO. The people there, they live in Jerusalem. Then, they had to be taken away to Babylon. Now they are moving again, going back to Jerusalem. Things around us are temporal, are transient. It can be a home. I was just thinking, I actually have lived in seven or eight houses um, in different stages of my life. And I think each time when you move, it's a very... In one sense, it's shaking you up, no? a, a house-moving event. And it's, some people take it quite well. Sometimes I take it well. Sometimes I don't take it well. We always want, there's always a part of us that wants to go back to the old, to keep to familiar things and so on. So it can be a home that changes. It can be a health issue, and that changes a lot. Whether we like it or not, the passage of time, will surely make us face the, the fact that our health changes. It may not change every day, but there are seasons in our life where we have to cope with. And now, very particular, particularly true, is this whole question of jobs and money as well. People are losing jobs. I remember, I think about a week before the MCO came about, I met a hawker. And he said to this extent, oh, next week, the lockdown will start again. 
the MCO will start again. He's just a hawker selling fruits. And you can hear the tone of his voice. It's so sad. It means that he can't continue his business because, you know, you, there's so much disruption in that. And I, my heart went out to him because it's so painful for him because he's, he can't continue the business. I've not seen him for five, six days already. And I think that is what he was referring to. But deep inside each one of us, we not only want to have permanence in our life, we want to have something unchanging that we are familiar with that we can rely on. And those of us not only have this one thing or this longing, but some of us, most of us who are believers in Christ, have found this rock, this solid rock that does not move, immovable, that we can rely on, on good times, bad times, in changing times. Jesus Christ is that one person that we can rely on. Yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus Christ is the same. We all know that we live in this transient world. Flesh is like grass. Here today, gone tomorrow. The breath of the Lord will blow, it withers and die. But the word of the Lord is forever. It's the only permanent thing in our life. And we need to get more acquainted with the word of God to bring this eternal world into our daily transient life. Let me give you a kind of a recommendation of how we, there are many ways you can do, but I learned from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, some beautiful things over the years. It says in, I, sorry, in Psalms 40, verse 6, in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have, requ you have not required. There is such a thing as coming to God, wanting to so-called earn His favor, to merit His favor. But we all know the gospel message that Jesus Christ come into this world to give us a free salvation. He freely loved us. He freely died for us. And the only thing we can do is to freely receive all that He has given to us through the cross. So this verse 6 hint in advance before Jesus came that in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. In fact, the Hebrews writer actually referred to this, quoted this text in his letter to explain to us that Jesus comes into this world in the flesh. So in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. But what, does, what has God given to us or what has God required of us is that we have an open ear. Listen to Him. Because if we listen carefully to Him, to His eternal word, you realize that He engages with us in such a free way. It is not because of what you have done that you'll be favored. It is not because of where you were born or what you were you inherited with. It's got nothing to do with that. El, the gospel is for all people. If you have a heart that is open to Him, and your heart can only be open if you open your ear as well, you realize He doesn't ask for all these things. Old Testament has lots of literature, lots of commands on offerings and on sacrifices, and how you can go about it, what kind of sacrifices uh, that you can offer to God. And they are all said abundantly clear, in, at least in Leviticus and so on. And you realize that it seems like God wants all these things. But from time to time, you hear a message, like the psalmist here now saying, hey, true, there's a lot of things said in the, uh, in the Old Testament, I mean in the Levitical laws, the temple laws, that this is how you approach in God. If you want to give an offering, it must be of this size, of this quality, and so on. But then, 
you hear a word like this that dispenses away everything that has been said in the Old Testament and they are narrowing on down onto something that God always wants us to consider as essential. And that is the state of our heart. That is the state of our ear, how we open our heart and open our ear to Him. Then He said, you have not required this. So in a certain sense, it's a very big relief to hear these words. That burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Right from the beginning, that is not God's plan. What He wants is our heart. What He wants is our ear. Our ear is the gate for Him to come to our heart. So the response of the psalmist, and which should also be our response, and we have to come to God, and I'm talking about how we can stay in the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, how we can engage in the Word of God profitably, is never, never to come to the Word of God condemned because you have not done, done this or done that. You will, never, never, you will never, never come to a place where you have done enough for God. We will always fall short in, the terms, in terms of what we are going to do for Him. So when He comes to us on free grace, it puts us in a very frightening position. Nothing you do can kind of manipulate Him. In fact, God does not want you to man manipulate Him. Don't try. But we are brought up in cultures that teach us, you know, if you do this, God will, somebody else will do this for you. It's, a, it's, a, it's what you call, uh, uh, do this tit for tat, that kind of thing. So we must dispel that idea from our heart and know that we can only come to God by one requirement only. And that's what he required, that's faith in him, faith in Christ. So settle this part as verse 6 wants to help us. Then he said, Behold, I come in verse 7. Behold, I come. Behold, I come tells you that you have to come completely. It is not, a, uh, you know, come with the mind and the body somewhere else. Or come with the body, the heart somewhere else. So body, soul, mind, and spirit must all be gathered before the face of the Word of God. We need to come in this way. Behold, look, I come, I come, I come. The eye there is a complete eye. It's the complete person. It's the complete you that approach the Word of God. Then when you come like that, in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. This is the marvelous part about the Bible. The stories that we hear in the Bible about A or about B about this character or that character, you will find that in some uncanny way, the Bible is, when they write about somebody, it's really talking about you. One day, you may read something about Abraham, and you realize that his circumstances that he was in is much like your circumstance today. And you, you can say the way Martin Luther said, aha, you realize that the connection about Abraham's life is with you. The aha, the, 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 the magical point in reading the Bible. Oh, it could. And so you reply, yeah, this is written about me. But why is this book written so long ago about a person even much more older can have a relation with me it's because it's the way the Bible is testifying to this effect. Behold, in the volume of the book, it is written about me. Or another day, you find something about Peter. Again, not all parts of Peter's life relate with you, but there comes a day, you are in that kind of situation, and ex that circumstance that you are in is exactly mirrored in Peter's life. I can say of Paul, and there's so many people every, in different times, in different ways, this word of God affects us. I was just told a story on the phone about a lady who suffered from depression. You know how she actually got herself out of that depression? She read every day Psalm 51. Now many of you will think 
we will know that that Psalm 51 is a psalm of confession of sins. I mean, it's a very heavy book. The opening parts, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's heavy and not heavy in a bad sense, but it, it, it speaks about a person in a very low position. And she read Psalm 51, you know, crying to God for help, crying to God for forgiveness, you know, confessing her sins are against God. Every day like this for a month. And that's how she comes to be healed. So the last part where it says that in I delight, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. We need to find the same kind of appreciation, the same kind of joy, like the psalmist in Psalm 119 feels about the Word of God. He delights in the Word of God. That I, I hope will be something we can learn and build that into our life where we can find delight in His Word to a point that obeying Him is a very natural outcome. So we come in faith, we come expectantly, expecting Him to speak to us. We come with this attitude that we will delight in Him and as a natural outflow of that, we will obey Him. Now we come to the third voice. This third voice, the first voice talks about the king's road. The second one talks about the king's word. Now we come to the king's messenger in verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 40. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. If we have heard the first two voices, naturally, before long, this third voice will belong to us as well. We need to be faithful messengers of God. We need to be proclaimers of His good news. Not bad news, good news. We need to join in with the voices of God to proclaim the message of God. It's something that will happen when the first two voices come in more, get into our heart and we realize that this third one is just a very natural flow. If we welcome the King, if we welcome the Word, and we find joy in the Word, the third thing will naturally happen. We will become proclaimers, we will become messengers of the good news, the herald of good news, people who trumpet out the voice of God fearlessly, boldly, and to a right extent, loudly as well. These are the heralds that we see in the third voice being mentioned. So this voice is for messengers. We are His messengers. We need to know how to speak for God. The word to the messengers is very simple. He said, do not fear. And we all have our fears. Talking if we want to proclaim the word of God to people. There are things that will make us frightened. But however it is, I do not want to give the impression that every day, where you work or where you stay, you start to tell everybody loudly about the Word of God, shouting on the top of your voice at the corner of the street and so on. But that is all the image people understand about heralds. But there is another way we proclaim. And that is basically being in contact with people. And we don't have to, well, while that verse tells us to shout loudly, our lives will also speak loudly if we know how to appreciate the first two voices' message, to know that the King is coming to us, and to know that the Word of God is in, in, eternal and internal as well, as we realize that things in the book of the Bible speak about us. So I just want to describe a bit on the message that is uh, heard here in this third voice. Yes, we need to be messengers. But what is our message? 
It's very simple. Behold your God. Tell all the people, look at God. Behold. Or be, well, in a certain sense, be amazed a bit. Right? Behold your God. You are introducing people, not so much a system or a business or a plan or a program. Essentially, our message is to help people know the reality of God. There can never, never be any kind of uh, so-called, what we will call evangelism, just by pure arguments. Yes, I think we need to defend our faith. Yes, I think we need to make clear that our Christian faith is a very rational gospel. It can be explained. You can have an understanding as a grounding for you to build up uh, and follow this message. So God is not like in such a way that He is mm, like He makes no sense. Like He's a senseless God. But God is a rational God Himself. He many times gives explanations. And I'm also aware many times He doesn't give explanations. But whenever He gives explanations, they are very rational. So you know that God is a reasonable God. And we can put that out to people. Sometimes people are touched by that. But even through all our arguments and speaking and rationalizing and explanation, People must hear pass through all that in order for them to know something of the reality of God. Of course, if you know the context of revival, revival is just simply one great manifestation of the reality of God. People going through the revival, uh, I've heard from various people, will come down to this one very simple fact. That all in such a year, uh, I'm thinking of the person who came from All Saints Church in Kuala Lumpur. This man lived through a revival there. And he said in one simple sentence, what happened to them, the young people at that particular time, that somewhere in the 70s. He said, we can only tell you this. God is real. We touch God. Now, God has been real all the while. So in revival times, in that particular atmosphere, he becomes more real. Like it or not, we are introducing people to a person, not a mental idea, not a program, as I said. We are not introducing just a name, but we are introducing a person who is behind that name. So we are asking people, or rather the third voice is reminding us, beyond our plans, beyond our programs, we need to have some organization. But at the end of it, we must be clear that we are presenting to people God. We preach Christ. We don't preach about Christ. We want to let people feel and touch that reality that is in God Himself. So our message is very simple. It, <clears throat> it does not require us to be sophisticately educated and so on. Yes, there's a part to learning, but learning is not everything. At the end of the day, people either by hearing you or by watching you feel something of the reality of God. So our message is singular in that sense. Yes, there are things that we have to clear through, but this message is simply to introduce people to the reality of God. As you can see, the later part of this whole chapter, Isaiah 40, will tell us that the one that is coming, uh, he is a strong God. We say God is coming. The king is coming. This king is a king that has two parts, that we, two characteristics that we need to hear. And that is that he has power. But he works his power by love shown through his tenderness. So he's powerful and he's tender. He's gentle. He's powerful as seen in the image of a, the, the word, the phrase, the strong one. And he's also gentle in the picture of a shepherd that makes provision for the weak lambs. He is gentle as seen by the way he caters for those who have particular needs. 
like the young ones. And this ruling arm that's found in chapter 40, verse 10, and the gathering arm of, that's found in verse 11, the second half, is a, complete, a more complete picture of this king that's coming. He is strong, he rules, and his arm is also strong for gathering his flock. And this is the image that we want to close with. We need particularly to realize that God's sheep in this church is scattered again. And He, we have to trust Him to gather us again. But even when we are dispersed like this, He's still the faithful God. He can be our individual shepherd. But at the same time, He is also wanting to keep us together as a flock. Shall we pray? Our God, we thank you for this time of meditation on your word. I ask that you will make us people who will be full of hope. Uh, things around us tend to speak a voice of hopelessness. But we turn to Isaiah. We see that the three voices urge us as believers to look ahead, to have hope, to put hope right in front of us, not to look back, but to strain towards what's ahead of us. We have only known so much about the King, but let our hands be stretched out to more, know more of the King, that we can come to a place where we can be confident in this God, this King, and in His Word as well. I pray for all the members at Gateway. May you watch over them like this gentle shepherd that Isaiah speaks about and that you will feed the young, you will look after them, you will cater to the special needs of the weak ones and may you as a whole provide a covering of protection over each one of us. We commit each one of us into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust that you will be able to join us for our online Bible study starting from tomorrow. And we, you will also join us when we gather together online on Friday, 8 p.m. as we discuss what we have read. God bless you.